Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoy these episodes, help support this podcast by becoming a Patreon. Sign up at www.patreon.com forward slash brew and ink. Your support will help our team to continue to produce great content like this. Also, check out our syndication page, SeriousWriter.com. Do you want to be a serious writer? At SeriousWriter.com, you'll find videos, topics, classes, resources, and a podcast, The Brew and Ink Podcast. We thank you for being a faithful listener. And now, on with the show. Welcome, everybody, back to another Brew and Ink podcast. And tonight we have a very special guest for you. We have an interbrew with none other than Frank E. Peretti himself. And if you're not familiar with any of his work or what he's done, you're about to be because this is a writer and author that you need to definitely check out. And we're here with Britt Mooney, MB Mooney. What's up? Myself, SM Freehand, and of course, Frank E. Peretti. Say hi. Hello, hello. This is me. <laughs> Yes, and we met Frank at a writer's conference a few weeks back over at Realm Makers, and we love Realm Makers. We go every chance we get, and we do podcast episodes on what they've done for us, Realm Makers, and how you know writing is as a whole in the whole Christian speculative fiction genre and what changes and stuff like that. So it was definitely a pleasure meeting you, and your keynotes were spectacular. So if anyone wanted to go and purchase those keynotes from Realm Makers, those were amazing, worth listening to. Oh, thank you. Talk to you about your, your writing career and, and the path that you're on and all that. And, and I think Britt's got some great uh, questions in line and all that. But we want to start with an uh, icebreaker question kind of for us. We're Brew and Ink. We love to uh, do uh, brews with our writing. And so we want to ask you, you know, what's kind of your favorite brew to enjoy while you're writing or while you're reading? Well, I'm into coffee. I'm into mochas. And uh, during the summer, it's iced coffee. So, um, yeah, uh, pretty simple. My wife, Barb, can come up with the most complex coffee recipes. <laughs> I like an American, a triple shot with this, the done, and you know. Keep it simple, right? Yeah, I, I want I want a venti mocha. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we brew them yeah, it's hard to mess up chocolate and coffee, right? It's hard to mess that up. <laughs> yeah, they're winners. So one of the things I was wondering about, um, you know, because we were just at this conference, and and it seemed to me that you were somewhat aware of this, and, and we don't have to spend too much time on it, but it seemed like you had such a joy seeing that you were an influence to such a large group of people. Uh, and I don't know how it was in the 80s when you got started, but just – what a great feeling seeing you and just the blessing that it seemed and the joy that it seemed to bring you as you were looking out over a crowd of people, kind of like you were a part of this, like you were a part of kind of growing this sort of genre and, and, and way of storytelling. Um, so uh, in all that, like who were your influences? Like, so when you were getting started in writing, like, like what were the stories that really inspired you uh, to think, hey, man, maybe I could do this. You know, maybe I could write. Oh, we're going back a ways, you know, because this is back in high school. I was into, hey, I read a lot of H.G. Wells. He was one of the original science fiction guys, you know. He wrote The Invisible Man, First Men on the Moon, and uh, all that. Conan Doyle wrote, interestingly enough, The Lost World, which was a very early treatment of the whole Jurassic Park idea. Yeah. And uh, okay, later on, and along came, well, Michael Crichton, Crichton a yeah. whole series of techno thrillers. Um, I, I was really into Mark Twain. Uh, I really liked his writing style and his, his, uh, his humor and so forth, his way of looking at things. So, yeah, and then, hey, we cannot discount the influence of movies and TV and superheroes and fantasy and all of that. I was so much into Disney. Uh, Mickey Mouse Club, eh, I could take it or leave it. The Mouseketeers got kind of tiring. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but 
But I mean, the, uh, the whole aspect of, uh, of Disney, the fantasy, um, uh, the animated films he did, uh, there was just a ton of stuff that I, I remember when I was a kid in junior high, I wanted to grow up and be a Christian Walt Disney. So that was kind of how it set the course of my life and my creative, you know, with the things that really interested me. And so the writing I got into it that I finally published was kind of grew, it grew out of all of that. That was the world I lived in, still live in. <laughs> yeah. How about like the Christian church world at the time? Like what was, were you a part of a church that was kind of accepting of those sort of ideas? Like I know different churches, especially back in those days would look differently at Disney or some entertainment stuff. Like, uh, like, did you talk to people about that? And did they have reactions to you saying that was kind of your dream? Oh, back in those days, Disney was still safe. Uh, uh, my, my, I had a church growing family and we would go see Disney films because uh, we knew they were safe. And so Disney was okay. He had to stand yeah. approval of my church anyway. What was it about the science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction sort of realm that you really were drawn to? Like, what, what was it about those type of stories that you think really struck a chord, whether it was Disney or H.G. Wells or any of that stuff? Oh, that's impossible to say. I'm just into it. I'm the kind of guy that loves different worlds and straddling different worlds. Most of my writing straddles. I don't go all the way into fantasy. I, it's I, usually, uh, you know, we're Real, in the real, we got our feet in the natural world, but then somehow we bring in the supernatural or the weird into the natural world. So, oh, like the oath is about an old mining town up in the mountains of Idaho somewhere. Real place, real people, but they are uh, haunted by a dragon that lives out in the woods. So, you know, then a uh, monster. Kind of interesting title. Wow, that's a rude small. But anyway, uh, that's a Bigfoot story. So you got right. you know real people that are dealing with Bigfoot. The darkness books, once again, you've got angels and demons and all this supernatural stuff going on in the background, but it's with just regular ground level people like you and me caught in the middle. So uh, I think that's, uh, if I were to kind of describe the way I write, I like to straddle both worlds in some way. And do you think that's part of your spiritual journey too? Like that that's part of your spiritual journey that you live, you know, we live in this world with what we see, but we know because of, you know, of, of our faith, we know and we experience that sort of spiritual side of things that we don't see. Do you think there's some sort of correlation with that as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, constantly. That always fascinated me. What, what are the angels doing? Oh, you know, when you grow up in, in, in a, in a in a church and a Christian culture, you hear stories all the time about you know missionaries who are out there in the jungle and and these uh, other enemy uh, tribe are going to kill this missionary as he was going through the woods and and it turns out they don't and he finds out later, well, we wanted to kill you, but we didn't because of the two warriors who were walking with you, you know. And, and those those kinds of stories were uh, just really cool because you realize, wow, there are really angels out there, and sometimes you see them. Interestingly, that's why the angels in my books are of different um, different ethnic backgrounds. You have Africans, yeah. and you have Samoans, and you like have uh, Orioles. Europeans. Uh, it's not that I wanted to be a politically correct or anything. Uh, that was easy enough to do. But the stories you hear about angels being seen all over the world always look like the people where they are. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, which I thought was just that was so cool. You know, the angels there. I don't know. It's, a, it's an intriguing idea that uh, we have so many different um Colors and ethnicities all around the globe, but there are angels for every one of us. And uh, oh, what an intriguing thought. So my angels are just every race, every every background. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the way they show up. And that, you hear the stories from all over the world, and they look just like the people wherever it is they're appearing. So, <laughs> And I thought that worked well for those stories, too, because... I feel for our kind of authorship, the kind of writing that we try to do with speculative fiction, the trick is trying to get that spiritual realm to just layer over the natural realm 
as natural as it can be because that's kind of how we experience it. We're just experiencing it from the natural and then behind the scenes, all the spiritual stuff happens. So how do you tie that in without getting too far out into like fantasy? Like I felt yours was pretty well grounded and, and having those different ethnicities and angels, it, it kind of kept it in that like, oh, okay, it's within this world and it makes an understanding of the spiritual and the natural right there on top of each other. Yeah. It works pretty well. Works pretty well. Uh, which kind of makes the darkness books. Well, I guess most of my books, uh, they're, I guess, unique in, well, I don't know how unique they are, really. But anyway, well, that's what I'd venture to say they're unique. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we got our feet on the ground, and from there, we look and see what else is going on. <laughs> you know? yeah. So that, that's kind of fun. Yeah, so what do you think it was about this present darkness that just blew up. Like, you know, we, you know, you talked about it at Realm Makers. I mean, that book was everywhere. I mean, I knew, I mean, everybody was reading that book and, and you kind of talked about how it just kind of grew and then kind of exploded. What, what do you think it was about it that really struck a chord at that time with people? Two things that I, now this is just from all reports that I hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number one is that it was just a downright good story. Uh, the consistent testimony is, oh, I couldn't put it down. My husband got mad at me because I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't pay attention to him. I was reading a story after story. I was up till four in the morning as I couldn't put it down and I lost sleep. Just the fact that the story was so engaging. People were just riveted to the story. And then uh, along with that, the, the other testimony that I hear all the time is how much it really opened people's eyes in terms of the spiritual conflict we're involved in and the efficacy of our prayers. And uh, those are the two big reasons. And you have uh, all kinds of reasons under that that are just as important. I just don't hear it quite as much. But how uh, people, there have been many people saved out of the occult. They were involved in... Uh, occult practices and so forth. And the book just really pow, opened their eyes to that and made them think twice about what they were involved in. And they got out of it. Um, there's other folks that had questions and the Lord was just drawing them by his spirit anyway. They got saved reading my book. So what is really cool is how the Lord takes what she gives him. And uh, he runs with it. He'll use it. And that is precious. I, see, I just wrote the book and off it went. Once it was gone to the publisher, I, <laughs> I didn't have any control over it anymore. And the Lord just took it from there. For me, I, I can just speak for myself. And, and I think for a lot of people, uh, so this is how I have explained it to people. Like if you had, if you had, tried to turn in a book in the 80s or maybe even now because I've tried to turn in some of these books that are like this and you had turned in some sort of fantasy novel where you know people were getting cut in half and their heads were getting chopped off and there was all this sort of like violence in it like I know Christian publishers today that <laughs> that are like uh oh, that's you're going that's a little too much man and I know that from personal experience right so my point is is that I thought it was so brilliant that back in the eighties, you had this like, this really like violent world in the spiritual, which is totally how it's almost described in the, in the new Testament, you know, and of course you embellish it with cool writing and battle scenes and stuff like that. But I remember even as a kid going, this is genius. Like he puts the kind of action in a Christian book that I love that that a lot of you know more christian novels or, or christian publishers would have kind of shied away from and i just thought that was i don't know how much you did that on purpose but for me as a kid because i was into stuff like i was into all sorts of writing at the time as a teenager and uh non-christian you know right but along with the spiritual along with the great story i totally agree it is a great just on its own was a great story and then you put in the spiritual stuff in the battle so i don't know how much you did that on purpose but with me it struck a chord <laughs> with me it was like that's super cool oh i did it all on purpose yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'm just like you i mean i love action and and uh 
oh, uh, you know, this is back in the days of Star Wars, Superman, and superheroes, and I mean, angels just, you know, flying around, their wings are blazing, and the swords are, you know, blazing, and, yeah. and they, you know, they throw their, they pierce their sword through a demon, and he explodes in a cloud of smoke, and, you know, uh, and the creepy demons are in their dark, gloomy little meeting room underneath some building, and the room is full of yellow sulfur, and the sulfur is coming out of their you know, their breaths, and uh, uh, it's cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. You had a description about a cloud of darkness coming, and then all the demons like unsheathed their sword, and like a red lightning, like kind of emanated from within that cloud. And I was like, "What a great description of like spiritual warfare!" Like the angels are watching and seeing this, and going, "You know, the time is coming. Like prepare yourself." And they're just seeing this black smoke cloud with rumbling red lightning within it. That was a, a big major <laughs> fictional element. Um, well, you see it in battle scenes and things like that, where the good guys are all arrayed on one side of a big valley or something, and then there's this big rumble and a cloud of dust rises, and yeah. you can hear the thunder zillions of hooves and the enemy comes over the hill and they're just without number and and all this kind of thing whether it's horsemen or whether it's you know nazi air force coming over britain or just this uh, this sense of impending doom so here are the angels on their hillside over the town of ashton and they're looking toward the east and it looks like a huge thundercloud moving their way and and it just gets closer and spreads wider and wider. You, you, you build it, baby. <laughs> you know, just just build it. And that's what builds you up to the climax. So it works really well. I, okay, see, I'm into that kind of stuff. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, and another thing I think you did really well, and I think Stevens read it recently. But what I, one of the things I remember, I mean, it's it's been a few years since I've, I've read it, because I have reread This Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness a few times over the years. One of the things that I just remember now as a writer, knowing how difficult it is to put those visuals in people's heads, like another thing you did well is was kind of that three-dimensional flying around. Like there was that there was like that chaotic sort of dog fighting sort of one perspective to another. Yeah, it was it's you man, you did it so well. Like it, it wasn't just like they had a battle, these guys were in this line, these like they were like in the air and flying around and stuff. And man, I just, uh, it was so well done. I, I just, uh, I, I just still remember how well done it was. That's uh, thinking cinematically, really watching a movie in your head. And it's real important when you're writing this out. Uh, I'm, I just went ahead and broke a lot of grammatical rules and things like that, because it's the, uh, bam, the impression you're trying to make on the visual aspect, you know, the, the imagination. It happens now. You don't talk about, okay, this happened and it looks like, no, you make it happen, you know. And uh, so that was fun. Like the angel, uh, uh, Cal is chasing the bad guy were far through buildings and through office rooms and the walls are slapping around as it's flying through the walls and over desks and through alleyways and over rooftops. And uh, I mean, it's the stuff that great movies are made out of. And so you try to put that in there. And, oh, that was fun to write, too. <laughs> well, so then that just begs the next question. Why have we never seen This Present Darkness as a movie? You don't have to give us all the dirty details it's if you don't want. It's content for it. But, I mean, like, it's, it is so cinematic. And, and, and it's, it's definitely one of those bridging two worlds kind of stories that, man, like, they would have loved that stuff in the 80s. Back to the Future, bridging two worlds. And, I mean, there's all sorts of... They would have so loved that. So why haven't we seen a movie yet? Well, I think the main reason is money. Uh, I've been approached by several different producers, uh, filmmakers wanting to approach this thing. And, uh, you know, hey, we want to do it. And then the very next thing, of course, you talk about is how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to get the backing, how we're going to get the investors, blah, blah, blah. So um, I can tell you another thing. Uh, this is history, so I can tell you is uh, well, a few years into the game, uh, there were three producers 
Um, I guess I, I guess I won't name them, uh, but uh, you know they were pretty well uh, known. One was a producer for uh, part of the Star Wars and the Indiana Jones franchise, so you know they were up there. Uh, they tried to do it and couldn't quite make it work, but then they got in cahoots with uh, 20th Century Fox because 20th Century Fox had the wherewithal to make a film out of it. So they sold the rights to 20th Century Fox, and then Fox sat on those rights for 35 years. Wow. Just a uh, property sitting in a drawer somewhere. Uh, there was one film producer who shared with me, he said, well, you know, sometimes these big movie houses, these movie producers, they have a property, and they don't really want to make the movie, but they don't want anybody else to make it either, so they just leave it and lock it up. Got shelved. So yeah, I got shelved, and so that's uh, thirty-five years of the story, and it's just in the past, oh, maybe two years. Well, oh, I could name names of pretty big people trying to get it to go, but okay, where we are right now is okay. Here we go again. Someone else, a major studio, is uh, we're negotiating a contract with them right now. And maybe something will come of it. But uh, it's promising as far as this particular production movie company does have the wherewithal to do the whole thing. They, they, they're big enough to do it. So then the question comes in, oh, are you going to maintain control? What are they going to do with it? Okay, I'll tell you right now. Whoever has the money makes the rules. Their money, their movie. And let's be realistic about it. We're going to hope and pray that the Lord can use whatever it is they come up with. But uh, it's even in the contract. It's all in, what, Latin? Um, um, <laughs> well, droit, I think. It's, maybe that's French. Uh, anyway, it's Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs> the essence of that particular paragraph is we can make any changes we want, and you can't sue us. So, um, okay, um, I'm just going to trust the Lord and uh, whatever they come up with, I hope the Lord will be able to use it. I am sure they will make changes. I hope that the thrills and the chills and the message of the book uh, are still in there. I think they will be. But, um, oh, I do have creative input, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Perrin. We'll call you. you know. <laughs> But we'll see. We'll see how. It goes. And and I think that this is an amazing time for a project like this to happen because special effects have come so far, even within the last ten or twenty years, that like you don't have to have the biggest budgets anymore to still have really quality special effects. I mean, you have to have the budget, but you don't have to have like the biggest budgets like you did with Jurassic Park. And in those days, like, like they're putting movie quality stuff on Disney plus and on Amazon prime and Netflix. I mean, they're they're there. And so there's so many different ways that you could get this story out now that that could still have, that sort of you still have enough money behind it, and and it, it might be just such a time as this. I, I, I I'm good, definitely going to pray. <laughs> I'm definitely praying. It's definitely a story that'll benefit from this type of technology that's yeah, out yeah, there yeah. nowadays. Yeah, what's interesting there is the original three producers way back. This is in the late eighties. Um, we were talking about the demons and stuff, and they would have had to create a physical uh, rubber animated whatever uh, Rafar yeah. demon, you know. All the demons would have had to be uh, pretty much live action actors in all kinds of uh, gear. Um, so it's, it's true, it's interesting how much the technology is changing. They can do anything. You can recreate that cloud of demons coming over the town. Yeah. And uh, you can create the flurry, just the explosion of angels coming out of that town, you know, in the big battle and all that stuff would be, <laughs> yeah. be very exciting to see. It'll make a great movie. So what about nowadays? Like what, what type of stories inspire you today? And like, what are you getting into TV, movie, books, anything like that, that ex inspires you nowadays? You know, I still like a good, a good sci-fi or fantasy. Uh, 
I was really into Indiana Jones just because <laughs> the excitement. Um, the Star Wars franchise got a little tiresome for me. I think it was too repetitive or something. It's uh, more action than story, but uh, yeah, definitely in the newer uh, movies. Oh, anyway, yeah, yeah. The uh, I, I like I like good writing mostly, just really clever writing, and uh, I'm engaged by uh, legal thrillers. Uh, courtroom dramas, if they're well done. I think that's always kind of fun to watch. Uh, we watch a whole lot of different stuff. You know, we, we stream and we play our old DVDs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I'm, just, I'm always open to a tip. You know, I listen to my friends. Hey, have you seen any good movies lately? Because uh, I don't know. It's kind of hard to find what I really like. Yeah, especially coming from a writer's perspective, you start watching something and then you're immediately pulled out and you're like, oh, well, that was not a good transition of character there. Or, you know, that that twist did not work. You didn't set that up well. Well, they switched motivations right in the middle of the scene. You know, yes. uh, you know technical. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You planted this, but you never paid it off. You know, what, what happened to so-and-so who was going to do those and such? They, they disappeared. You know, you know, when you're a writer, you think about those things. So, yeah, sometimes the sometimes dialogue, uh, there's great, great dialogue. I notice that when it's really great dialogue and when it's really, you know, kind of like high school play dialogue. <laughs> uh, that bothers me too. I say, oh, they, they don't have, they don't have A grade writers on this. It's kind of B or C, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, did you find that you had a really change your writing style or the way that you did dialogue when you were writing in like uh this present darkness versus like the cooper kids series where it's like more middle grade the the cooper books um you, you don't you don't write quite as uh, as much subtlety in it uh it's more matter of fact and understandable and uh <laughs> and what's interesting I don't, I'm not sure how long I did this for all the books, but I remember reading those first few Cooper books. Of the dialogue was kind of, um, it sounded a little contrived, like, you know, this is how a hero would talk, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you're writing for kids. Yeah, you're writing for kids. So uh, sometimes I read Dr. Cooper and I say, oh, please. <laughs> you know, he sounds like kind of the wise, fatherly. <laughs> guy who knows all the answers, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I think I may have polished a little better toward the, the, the later boots in that series, but starting out was kind of, yeah. <laughs> hey, the kids still like him, so it still works. Now, how far into your, your writing did those series come out versus, you know, with your adult stuff, the young adult? Oh, they, they went quite a while, several years, you know, because, uh, let's see, I wrote the first of the Cooper series, that got published first. But I already had this present darkness pretty much written. Uh, but I just didn't have a market for it. And it turned out that uh, Crossway Books read the Cooper series and liked it. So then they decided, well, why don't you send us that other big idea you had? <laughs> and it turned out they liked that. And then the rest is history. They published it. But yeah, I was doing... Uh, uh, some of my uh, adult novels um, and the Cooper kids kind of in, in between, you know, uh, do one, then do the other. So, yeah, they were in there for a while. Yeah. So uh, a, a couple scenes that I just want to chat about for a second. So I think one of my favorite scenes in any book ever, one of the most memorable scenes that I've ever read is in Piercing the Darkness, the salvation scene that you wrote from the spiritual perspective, from the unseen perspective, is one of the most memorable scenes. Like, I've literally just gone back to that book to read that scene. I remember crying when I read that scene as a, as a teen dude. I was like, mm -hmm. that is one of the most powerful scenes that I have ever read. And uh, so can you talk for a minute about just as you went into that scene, how you wrote it, like the perspective that you were trying to get to, because it, it's totally worked for me. <laughs> well, I cried when I wrote it. Uh, I got inside Sally Beth Rose's heart and mind. And I, as I recall that scene, she, 
she had come to that point where she just, and, and in her nature, she was kind of a negotiator, a, a diplomat. I mean, she uh, kind of sat down for a point by point meeting with the Lord <laughs> mm-hmm. to, uh, to just get right with him. And, you know, it went from a, a simple, practical, logical approach to her problem of being separated from God, of being lost, and being a sinner. She had to work all of that out rationally first. And then as she's working it out rationally, the whole spiritual dimension comes into it, and she begins to feel the deep, deep emotions of all that. And that begins to pour out. And then, of course, the angels are looking out for her and guarding her because this is her moment. And they want to make sure that she comes to the Lord and gets this little item of business taken care of. (laughs) And so by the time it's done, it's a glorious scene. The angels are rejoicing and surrounding her. And, uh, whoo, yeah, that's a real tear-jerky scene. Anybody that's ever, you know, it, it's a good scene. And you know, yeah, I've heard a lot of people tell me that that was their favorite scene from that book, that that was very memorable. It really touched them. So, yeah, that, I'm going to have to read that again by a long time. <laughs> well, it, it, was su- it was such a great scene because the angels, they're the observers. Like, they, they, they kind of see this happen. And, but you still feel all those emotions because you you set it up so well like her character and where she is on her journey and uh, man I, i'm just telling you I, I it doesn't surprise me that you've had probably had a million people tell you how amazing that scene is that's a wonderful scene yeah and it's a, a lot of people told me about that scene that they love that scene mm. well one of my favorite books that you have written is the and you talked about it at the conference is the prophet I, I don't know. I don't know all of why, but there. But for some reason, it's. I don't know whether it's just because of my own kind of relationship with my dad, kind of at the time. But I was really super drawn to that book when it came out. Like I, I, I probably read it like in a day or two or something. I mean, I just like consumed this book and just that character of how he was resistant. And that conflict he had with his dad's sort of preaching on the on the street corner, and then how he starts to change throughout the book, man, I, it's one of my favorites. So, you know, I know you talked about it a little bit at the conference, but I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit about you know writing that book. Oh wow! Uh, well, prophet at the core of it was about uh, the gatekeepers who determine what we know. Um, and it was about truth, and uh, that's why I made the prophet a news anchor, mm-hmm. because here he is right in the middle of a, of a news world. Uh, this here, here are the gatekeepers who have a meeting every morning deciding what the rest of us are going to know, and that becomes the news. And in the middle of all this, this guy becomes... God starts speaking to him and gives him insight into what people are thinking and what, what the, where their hearts are. And so, yeah, I think part of the, the hero's journey there is his dad was kind of a eccentric, kind of a, um, well, he was just a kind of a prophet in his own. Right, of course, because he was just outspoken and he would speak the truth and get in trouble no matter who. You know, no matter whether people liked it or not. And it used to drive his son nuts, you know, apologizing for his dad. And then, but it is the truth that works through all of this. Eventually, however you couch it, however you package it, however you select it or try to keep from keep it from being heard, the truth is going to work its way through. And that's what happened to this main character. He's a news anchor. And he finds the lesson in his whole experience where he works and so forth is, hey, you are responsible to the truth. And sooner or later, you're going to have to speak it. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting examination of that. 
Yeah, and I think it's a very powerful statement and, and story to be told uh, during this day and age, too. Amen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. More so. Can we get that movie made? Can we get that in, made into a movie or a or a, or an eight episode uh, you know series? Um, can we get that made? Can I write the script for that well, one? Be, well, that would be easier than this present darkness. You know, you probably wouldn't need practically. But I did, but. I, I was just, I was thinking the same thing when, when you, and, and you mentioned it too at Realm Makers, that it, it's an even more impactful message and important message even today. Like it hasn't gotten better. Like, you know, the, the, the agendas and the money and the corporate nature and the gatekeepers of, of, of our news media, it, it hasn't gotten any better, you know, in the last 20 years or however long it's been since I've 25, maybe since I've read that book. And bear in mind also the incredible multiplication of, here's the word, technology that has made the gatekeeping all the more powerful and pervasive. Back in the day when I wrote Profit, we didn't have a zillion different stations we could tune into. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have laptops. We, we didn't have, I mean, um, we didn't have Google. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't know. The, um, the proliferation of information and the gatekeeping is a zillion fold what it was back then. But the hearts of people who run all that stuff are still the same. But now they have all the more power. And on the other side of that, you have the consumers, the end users, who um, over the generations have been so conditioned to just, you know, Click, consume, uh, you know, uh, they're on that screen hours and hours every day. And their thoughts are being formed and their information base is being formed by people who are dictating what they know. And that's part of one of the talks I gave here at Realm Makers. I was talking about the danger of technology. This is one of the dangers is that we are immersed in this stuff. It is everywhere. It's like it's like a fish in water. You can't really you know, ask a fish, what's water like? Well, the fish would not be able to answer you because water is the only reality, so much so that the fish takes it for granted, doesn't even think about it. Well, you have this information explosion um, and the, the power of, uh, of this illustrates too how rapidly uh, morals and worldviews uh, have changed. They used to take generations for morals to change. It can take one or two years now. Bam! Like that. Yeah. Suddenly yeah. an entire nation is thinking opposite of what they used to think. And um, so, I don't know what got me off on that, but, uh, oh, well, we're talking it's about technology yeah. being ubiquitous. Yes, ubiquitous your technology, yes. Yeah, and well, and you know, it was just coming off of that book, and and it's it's so, I don't, it's not strange if you know how God works. Like if you're a person of faith, you're saying hearts and people haven't changed in 25 years. You know, the morals can change as quickly and rapidly as they want, but at our core, we're still human beings, and and God hasn't changed. And you know, if we're people of faith, we know that, and so, and and that's the beauty of storytelling is that stories have a depth to them. Stories have a depth to them that they can be timeless. Whereas, you know, if you're doing one certain topic, you know, it can kind of be locked in its time frame. It can be locked in its culture. It can be, but telling a story is so powerful. What is maybe a book that, that you would consider a deep cut for Frank Peretti uh, that maybe not a lot of people know about, but you think is one of your best, like to you, like, because sometimes I write a book or I do something and like nobody knows about it or one or two people like it. And I think, man, I think this is maybe one of the best things I've ever done, <laughs> but nobody likes it or, you know, um, like, do, do you have one of those like through your career where you think this never really struck a chord or never really became popular, but you think it was one of the best things you've done? Oh, well, illusion comes right to mind. Yeah. Because that really is a good book. It got good reviews and I poured my heart into that thing. And, uh, you know, 
I think it had a lot to do with the market and my readership. It just wasn't a quote-unquote Frank Peretti story. We didn't straddle the real world and, the, and I mean, the natural world and the supernatural world. All of that is mainly a sci-fi story. It was highly character-driven. Well, let's see here. We're talking kind of blindly to the people out there. It's a story about a uh, couple who are stage magicians. They're uh, really popular, and they play in Vegas, you know, and they're on TV, and everybody knows, you know, Dane and Mandy. That's the, you know, that's this uh, duo, this fantastic duo that does all this amazing magic stuff. And uh, anyway, they're in a car accident, and uh, Mandy is uh, burned alive in the car, a horrible death. And okay. I'm going to be careful. I won't spoil it. But uh, this is, I don't know if you call it a time travel story. It's kind of the opposite. It's okay. If you've got a computer, look at it this way. you got a computer and uh, you probably have that little reversion thing you can do on your computer where if your computer gets fouled up, you can uh, put in some commands of some kind and revert the computer back a week or a month or whatever to the condition it was a, a time month capsule. Ago. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's how you get the bugs out of it. Okay. Well, mysteriously, you know, of course, this is an unraveling mystery that, that proceeds through the book. Mandy is reverted. She uh, is thought to have perished in the accident, but uh, some sneaky sci-fi type people <laughs> actually spirited her body away and reverted it. And anyway, Mandy suddenly finds herself uh, back in, I don't know what year was it? Well, anyway, she's back to being 18 years old. She has reverted back to before she ever met Dane. Now, she is living in the present. But she's 18 years, I mean, she's many years in the past. Suddenly, she's in a world with, of cell phones and computers and all this stuff. She has never seen a computer. She's never seen a cell phone. She's living back there, and so people think she's crazy. But anyway, of course, in the course of the story, Dane is, uh, he's in his 60s. He uh, begins to mentor this young woman and teach her how to be a magician having no idea that this young woman sitting right across from him is the girl that he met and married because it never happened. <laughs> and uh, well, to her, it never happened. But anyway, it's an intriguing idea, but um, it's all about the quest mm. for these two lovers to find each other again. And so uh, it's a very dramatic story. And I thought it was really heart touching and dramatic and and uh well i think it was but it just wasn't an angel's demon story you know and uh i think that's what people were looking for but it's a, it's a good book and uh yeah i uh i poured my heart into that puppy and uh, the critics really liked it they they thought it was one of my best oh and i had to learn a whole lot of magic <laughs> to do that book <laughs> I had a magician actually help me with a lot of the staging and the, and the tricks and things. When I was a realm maker, somebody asked me if I learned magic tricks uh, as I was writing that book. And yeah, yeah, I did. I learned a lot of magic tricks. I had a whole library of, of magic books and videos and learned all this stuff. I can't do any of that stuff. Slide of hand, stuff disappeared. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, boy, it is an art. And you really got to practice it. I can make a coin appear in my hand and then did a couple of card tricks. And yeah. The rest of the time I could, I'd drop everything. <laughs> I couldn't do it. But it's uh, really helps you admire my eight year old and my four year old and they asked me to keep doing it again. <laughs> that's about as much as I can do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's about my level, you know. <laughs> that's awesome. So uh what are you working on now? Like, what are you, what are you writing? What are you working on now? What are some ideas? I don't, you have to give me ideas, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are you working on now? Well, I'm uh, finishing up some other speaking engagements and I'm going to be really glad. A, I'll be glad to do those because they're always terrific, very meaningful. Rome was incredible. I really enjoyed that. 
Um, but I'll be glad to get those done because I just want to go home and uh, just stay there and, and work on a book again. Uh, I need to live a quiet life where I can just kind of concentrate on one thing. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm hoping I can do a third darkness book. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a long while. Wow. So, I mean, let me tell you what kind of fun the Reeves is and what Hank is up to and what Marshall are up to. You know, they're a lot older now. I, I'm going to have to figure out, oh boy, now what year are we in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they may be old enough to be dead by now, so I may have to kind of fudge a little bit. <laughs> but I, it, I've got some intriguing ideas there. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I, I'm seeking the Lord about that because that's the best way to bless and edify the body and you know and build the kingdom of God and that, that's that's what yeah. I'd like to do. So we always like to try and give our listeners an idea, a deep dive into someone's like writing process and, and their journey of writing. Like for you, what has always been your your do you have like a set schedule that you go with? Do you have so many words you try and do a day or do you have like a favorite place that you like to go write? What what kind of gets you in the mood or like how often does it when you're like, yes, this was a successful week that I, you know, got it done. Oh, <laughs> well, you can't wait to be in the mood. You have to do it. Writing takes a lot of discipline. That may be one yes. reason I haven't gotten a book done for quite a while. <laughs> uh, man, oh, man, I tell you, everything tries to... Uh, I don't live there now, but in my one of my previous homes, quite a way back, way back, uh, way back, I actually uh, built a little studio out in the backyard. Just a little, I think it was an uh, eight by ten, little bitty thing. And uh, I didn't have any phone or anything like that. I just go out there and I'd sit at a table and a chair and I'd just write. And I got I, that's where I wrote the illusion. I just did the whole book out there, and that's good because if you're writing at home, you have to kind of close the doors or get some understandings going. Hey, I got to work because everything else comes up phone calls and something that doesn't work and trash needs to be taken out and you know, and, uh, you got to cut the grass, I, you know, go down the list. Um, I, uh, I try to put in five hours a day. I, I, I had I met a few writers who try to do so many pages a day. I just do. I, I write by the hour. I've got one. I've got one. I got it right here. It's my, my kitchen timer. I set that for five hours, make it wow. down down. I uh, sometimes I actually get in five hours, and most of the time I don't. <laughs> but uh, it gives me something to aim for anyway. Uh, I am a, I guess the term is plotter. There are plotters and pantsers. Is that the word? You write by the seat of your pants. I don't write by the seat of my pants. Well, actually, I do, but first I plot. I, I do plan my books. I outline, I let everything out so I know where I'm going because that is, for me, the most effective way to plant things, to plan the twists and the triggers and the payoffs, and you know where you're going. Now, once you get that done, then when I get into the scene and I've got my outline figured out, I know what has to happen, then it's real seat of the pants. It's, it's you go. Or you take your characters take you. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. In a lot of instances, but uh, it's a combination though. They uh, they do grow and they start coming up with their own ways of saying things and uh, all of that. But you know where they have to go, and uh, so I know what I need to accomplish in every scene. And uh, and I think Stephen James is correct when he warns against being too fast. You know, too. Uh, strict a plotter because if you're too strict a plotter then your characters start feeling forced and they start doing and saying things to make the story work but it's not natural for them yeah you know, well why did he say that well he said it because we have to sell it the next scene well you can't do that um that's where that's where you get into the mistakes that uh, you see in a scene uh, if you're a writer, you probably notice it quicker. Some folks reading a scene could notice it. You know, it something feels wrong about this, and the wrong thing might be 
that suddenly a character's emotions will shift for no particular reason, or their motivation will shift for no particular reason, or some chain of dialogue will just start out of the blue, out of nowhere. And why are they saying that? And it's not natural, but they're doing it because the writer says, well, in the next scene, this such and such has to happen. Well, these are things we have to accomplish here. And so it's, with experience, you learn to balance those things out and stay real. You want your writing to yeah. be real. Even if it's fantasy, it has to be real. Absolutely. Well, it almost has to feel more real if it's fantasy. Like that almost sells the fantasy world if the if the motivations and the emotions and the and the characters feel real, like feel genuine and authentic. It, you know, it almost has to be more. Um, so yeah, so a, a couple things with what you just said in my household we yell out story reasons. So like when we're, we're, when we're watching a movie or a TV show and something just happens out of the blue for those reasons, we, my kids, I have, you know, my kids have been brainwashed to, to, to pay attention to the story good writing yeah. uh, to good writing. And they'll, they'll just shout out story reasons uh, when something will happen out of the blue. Cause we'll go, what the heck, where did that come from? Um, and, and the other thing is, do you know, Stephen James or are you, uh, are you just, um, talking about his writing? Cause I actually, I, I know Stephen James, I mean, we're, I'm, we're in, I'm in a network with him and, uh, he's a, he's a very cool guy. Yeah, I know. Him. Okay, good. That's awesome. We've met through writers conferences yeah. and then I did a blog, uh, uh, a podcast with him and yeah. I, um, I was at the North Carolina Blue Ridge Writers Conference in North Carolina. Uh, we got together and had dinner. He he bought dinner too. He bought dessert too. So he was <laughs> it was great to see him again. Yeah, he seemed like a really cool guy the, the one time I met him yeah. at the Serious Writers Conference. Yeah, very cool. And um, and you also know Alan. Alan and Arnold and I are are have gotten closer over the last few years, and I saw you guys kind of hanging out at Realm Makers too. What a great guy. Well, yeah, he was my publisher back. Uh, he worked on uh, The Oath with me and mm. Monster and a few others. He's the guy, I forget which book it was, I killed him in that book. Um, yeah, he was one of my corpses or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's pr quite a great honor, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'm the same way as you. I mean, I, I, I have a general outline I know where I need to go. I'm, I know the big beats to hit, but, and I have to, for some reason, I, I, I for me, I, I talk about it like this. I, I say, I'm kind of like a sculptor, you know, like a sculptor looks at a blank, whatever thing of stone and has to get an image in his mind before he starts chipping away. That's kind of how I am. I have to feel like I know the shape of it. I don't have to know every detail. I just have to know the basic shape of it so I can get started and I know where I'm going. I know what the theme is. I know what I'm trying to say. I know what the, who the characters are and what their motivation. I mean, there's some some things I have to know, and then 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 I then I'm more of a pantser. Then I get there, you know, and I just have fun writing the story. But I have to know, I'm not a complete pantser like some people. <laughs> well, I yeah, I think I, you and I are pretty much in the same mentality. I'm reading a novel right now. Uh, it's a a police. Uh, you know, investigative thriller. And, uh, well, I don't know. I think this guy is a pantser because it, I got to be careful saying this. Some pantsers can write and it really works. Some pantsers, you can tell they're pantsers because the story doesn't have the structure you might expect. Uh, what I'm encountering in this particular novel is a real flat line. Um, the story just kind of goes at the same pitch. Uh, just, you know, for uh, the whole thing is at the same level of tempo and pitch and suspense, and it never changes. And I, I get the feeling that the guy didn't really plan out, how can I make this book build and get more interesting? Um, I can compare, I won't name the, the guy that I'm criticizing, I'll name uh, Michael Connolly. Now, see, he's, I've read a lot of his stuff because he does uh police and he does uh courtroom he has the mickey Fowler series that i i read all of those but he i don't know he might say well i'm floating i know i'm right by the seat of my pants but he sure feels structured to me because 
his stories just grab you and you know the hero's going to be in trouble and he gets in trouble, then he gets in more trouble, and then there's more problems, and then more suspense, and more how in the world is he going to get out of this? And uh, that takes planning as far as I've been able to experience. Yeah. You have to plan something. Or a lot of rewriting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you do, you do a lot of rewriting anyway. You can just plan the book. Uh, you change your plan, uh, you know. But at least you know where in the, where in the world you are. Yeah. What's the most you've ever felt like you've had to rewrite from a first draft to like a final draft? Oh, man. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that. It seems like I've always had to rewrite quite a bit. Uh, I, uh, I'll i do a, a scene or two on one day, then the next day I'll go back and read what I did and I'll do a little rewrite then and uh, then come back. And then I've also, uh, I'll write about half, halfway through the book, then I'll go back to the whole beginning and read all the way through from the beginning up to that midpoint just to see where I'm going and what direction it's going, if it's paced right. I'll do a lot of rewriting there before I continue on the second half. Because I want the thing to have cohesiveness. And uh, <laughs> Sometimes you get so far down a story, you have to go back and like, wait, where did we start here? And, and get yourself back caught up to where the second half is going. So that makes sense. Oh, my, yeah. And one of my problems, well, I think that everybody deals with this, is keeping track of who's who. Yeah. Uh, I, I had so many characters in darkness. I met one lady. She showed me her book to, you know, for me to sign it. And in the inside of the cover, she had a whole list of all the cast, <laughs> who they were, that she'd written in there so she could keep them all straight. Um yeah, I have to go back and check my own facts <laughs> and my own names and everything, make sure I'm consistent. And hey, if I planted something, all right, are we paying this off or are we going the right direction with that? You always have to double check your work. There's nothing holy or sacred about it. <laughs> no, this is hard work at that point. Yeah. That's yeah. just hard work. But it's good. It's good work, man. Like, uh, you know, like uh, I'm sure you have that feeling like a lot of us, you know, when you see that whenever when it's published when you feel like it's it's come to a good spot like that feeling of it really captured something in a story you know i i know it's it's worth the work you sometimes you got to keep that motivation in mind but it's worth worth it's worth all that that's what brings us back to something you talked about earlier your writing basically survives beyond you uh in time and space it goes farther than you could ever go mm. it goes longer than you could ever go. Uh, I imagine, well, this is true now, like the Cooper books, the kids' books. I uh, wrote those back in 83 was the first one. Those kids grew up and they've had kids. And then those kids have had kids. There's uh, three generations now I've read the Cooper books. It just shows how, how far reaching some of these things can be. And by God's grace, uh, I may be gone from this earth, and people will still be reading this present darkness. And uh, it's something that really lasts. And I think uh, it lasts. Some books are going to last even longer than the TV shows and the movies we're watching. So that's something to remember. I, I think it's a great thing to, re to remember. Uh, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why drawn to stories, and I think it's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you in the beginning, like, what what inspired you? Because, uh, you know, uh, that's part of telling stories, right? It's, it's passing it on to the next generation. It's passing something on. And, um, and, and, you know, you didn't know HG Wells personally, right? I mean, like, like for you to be inspired by <laughs> something he wrote, you know, but it, it, it survived beyond himself and, and the messages that he tried to put in there and the different ideas and stuff. Um, and and there, there's a real power to telling those sort of stories. And, um, and I, I, and I think that's great. And I think you've definitely done it, man. And I, and, and I hope you really felt that at Realm Makers, that, that sort of connection that, that a lot of people, Obi-Wan, uh, to the Patty, you know, Padawan, that, uh, that was, uh, that was great. It was amazing. Uh, I really did feel like everybody's grandpa, you know, uh, just 
all these young up and comings just full of fire, you know, and full of energy. And, uh, boy, God's going to do some wonderful things to you folks. It's it's going to be really great. It was an honor to be there. Uh, get, get a chance to be kind of a <laughs> kind of a papa <laughs> to everybody. That was fun. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, you know, we're getting close to the end of our time here, and and and. Uh, just as we close, where can some people see you? Where can people get a hold of you? Your website? What's a good website or Facebook? Or uh, what's a good way to kind of check out your books and, and what you're doing? Well, I suppose you just have to go to the market. You go to a Christian bookstore or a bookstore bookstore, or you go on Amazon. Uh, you can Google me. <laughs> I'm sure you'll show up. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I had Facebook once because uh, we were trying to stay up with the technology. And, oh, this is how people know about you now. This is how they follow you. Be on Facebook. Be on Twitter. And uh, that got to be such a hassle and such a time consumer that I, I, I just said, I can't, I can't do this. Because there's only one of me and there's thousands of them. And they all get on Facebook and they ask me all these questions and and, and I, I just can't keep up with it. So, well, hallelujah, good, uh, more power to all you other Facebookers out there, but I've got other things to do. <laughs> well, well, Frank, this was an honor for us and uh, and and you gave so much value in this interview and I just, uh, I, in this conversation and I know a lot of people are going to be really encouraged and inspired by the things that you shared. So thank you very much, man. Well, this was real special. I'm glad we could get together. Yeah, man. It was very nice. Yeah, we appreciate your time. And as always, we like to say at the end of our, our episodes, raise a glass to inspiration and stay inspired, guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>